Yeah, you know, Small Things Dentistry, thanks for joining us. This is a place where we share all those passionate hints and tips in dentistry. And if you're new here, take a look around. We've got a whole bunch of stuff on uh, different types of disciplines in dentistry, and we're always learning. Every day I'm learning, even though I've been doing it for 20, year, for 20 years. And listen, um, this is a case we're going to talk about here, this root canal in tooth number 25. It's really special because Ashraf, the patient, asked me to post this. We're going to try to, I was going to try to live stream it, but I just didn't have the right software up. So that didn't work. But upcoming, we're going to be, uh, you know, placing a post is actually a really critical technique that seems to be overcomplicated. And, you know, Ali to say over at Real World Endo, I really, I learned this technique from him doing a simple cut of the gutter percha, twisting off and then fitting my post and cementing it in and using this material floor core as your core cement and as your cement po as your post cement and your core build up. So I'm just cutting a video for that. It'll be up soon. And also, um, if you listen to this, see if I have the video up. We're going to be talking about fracture necrosis down the road. So that's uh, what's upcoming. We're just going back to get the tooth. And that's Super Mario if you don't know. If you're too young. Because I'm in my mid-40s now. Anyways, back to what we're talking about. So let's talk about this endo here. My buddy Majid Mishrikid, uh, Mishriki post uh, prosthodontist in Ottawa, Canada. He was doing an emergency weekend and the uh, Ashraf rolled in with a lot of pain. So his tooth was tooth number diagnosis, tooth number 25, necrotic with symptomatic able periodontitis. Um, and the tooth number one, tooth number 26 is going to be extracted down the road. So we're going to talk about tooth number 25. And there's a bunch of tips that uh, I used through this technique uh, and they're really helpful. They've, I've learned them from others. So this is the final at radiograph. And you know what's really cool is that we got a split down here. This is, I, I love this image, even though it's cheesy endo. You've got a two to one to two to one and then to two. So we got these crazy splits down here and there's a couple tips I want to talk about. And what I tried to do is make kind of composite posts in here. Um, we can go down the road of that discussion down the road. I'm also going to show you, yeah, we take comb cuts during our, our GP. So I'll show you just a couple tips how to make that because premolars I find are a little more complicated at the beginning on how to get on trying to get good uh, periodical radiographs during comb fit. And here's the proper comb fit radiograph. So anyways, uh, let's get started. Not that picture. Showed you that already. So <clears throat> when Asher showed up about a, uh, today or yesterday, actually, he already had, if this is the, let's see, this is the front of the clamp. So the back of the clamp. So this is a distal. If you remember, there's a large carious lesion here. So he showed up and uh, my buddy Magic had already built up this perfectionist uh, composite that's super sealed. And then he placed uh, triage uh, glass ionomer into the uh, access. So I'm just using a number two round burr actually, but it's pretty tiny. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out. It's going to take forever to cut through that. So I'm going to switch out. You'll see me switch out to a number four round. Number four round to, uh, to remove all that composite. Sorry, not the composite, the triage. And then we're going to get into the access. So being a prosthodontist, he did a great job, amazing job with his access. And what I'm trying to do here and zoom in, uh, this is a Leica microscope, if you're wondering. It's actually uh, Mishriki's own microscope, so I use his in his practice. What I'm trying to focus on, you can't really see it, is actually there's a crack going right down this mesial marginal ridge. You can see the start of it here and here. And we've actually got, you know, it's broken through and decay. So what we're going to do is we're going to repair this, remove that with, in place of a composite at the end. You know, I was initially going to place an amalgam in this tooth, uh, but then I saw this amazing composite sealed restoration by my buddy. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to add to it. I'm not going to remove it. There are a lot of different restorative options for this tooth. You know, if you've got any comments, go ahead and place them below. It'd be really nice to hear uh, what your comments are. If you normally place posts, crowns, cuspal coverage restorations, uh, what type of treatment do you do? So you can see here we've got, um, so if this is the clamp here, we've got our buckle. This is our buckle side of the tooth. This is our palatal. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we're going to do first off is we're going to rinse that out. We're going to irrigate with sodium hypochlorite. You can see I've got a bend in my irrigating needle. That makes sure that I know exactly. This is short because I don't know the exact lengths right now. So because it was just literally a clean out, there was not much of a pulpectomy completed. You just want to get 
kind of area sodium hypochlorite down the canals with it. I think it was even a 10 file because it was necrotic. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our lengths first and watch how this 10 file just drops. It's like, boom, right to length. Isn't that amazing? Now that is a great pulpectomy. Not ledge, not nothing. So what we're doing here is I'm going to one red bar on the on the apex locator. We're going to measure it. It was it actually so it, it measures 22 to one red bar. So I'm going to subtract one millimeter. Uh, it it was in focus on the microscope, but not here. And then my buccal canal, I think it's either the same or a millimeter longer. If I can recall. Let's see here. 20, that's hard to read. I think they're both the same. So what I'm going to do now is you saw me drop that 10 file right to length. So there's not much, I mean, the glide path is already established. So what I'm doing here is I'm just taking my wave and gold primary. You can use whatever rotary file you're use, used to. <clears throat> and I'm just going to run it to length. And what I'm looking for is, is there any debris on my flutes? Where is it cutting, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to do that. We're going to rinse out really well, make sure, rinse out with sodium hypochlorite, and then I'm going to recheck my working length. I find there can be a large working length discrepancy between the primary and the medium, just because it, if this was curved in, say, the buccal lingual direction, like it, you don't see it on the, on the radiograph, uh, you can get shortening of your working length. Just because the, you know, the files are stiff, relatively stiff, and they're going to make the canal straighter. So I'm rechecking my working length. I don't believe it changed. It's stuck around 21 mils uh, to the apical constriction or a millimeter short of one bar, whatever you want to measure it to. So we're going to irrigate lots and then we're going to take our medium. And when I pull this file out, what I'm looking for is, whoop, that was <laughs> the wrong one. I'm looking for debris on the, on the flutes. So let's just see if we can get that in focus. So you can see we've got great cutting of our apical third of our of our tooth so say for example i take this and i place it apically and i get some debris here but none here now that makes me think it's not always the case but it makes me think maybe my working length is too long and this has gone outside the uh the apex uh with the 35 it's difficult especially to do that on a premolar just for it to drop out because they're pretty typically smaller uh, but on larger canals it's totally possible like a palatal of an upper six Looking for, I'm looking for debris again. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're just cleaning and shaping. This is my final shape. It's going to be a medium, which is a 3506 in the Wave 1 Gold uh, system. So what I'm going to do here, actually, you'll see me start to kind of, I'm like scraping the walls. And what I'm doing here is I'm just either breaking a biofilm. It was a necrotic tooth. Uh, in a vital tooth, we're breaking up. Vital tissue. And you know how I learned this was actually getting my own root canal because I was watching my good friend, John and Adonis, in my palatal canal. And I was thinking, why is he doing that? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's to break up all that vital tissue because I had a irreversibly inflamed tooth cracked and I had him do a root canal because I was getting tired of the pain. So we're going to irrigate, irrigate lots of irrigant. And then we're going to activate. So this is full strength hypochlorite. We're going to activate it with my endo activator. So this is sonic activation. Those three bars on the uh, on the on the on the uh, on the activator tip measure 18, 19, 20. So I'm using those. I'm keeping it. The instructions say keep it 20 mil or two millimeters short of your working length. So I'm rinsing out with hypo, just getting all that debris out of there. I'm using the bend in my irrigating needle. It's two millimeters short of my working length. So I'm going to run that whole syringe down. And then what you're going to see me is suction that back. And the next we're going to be using, uh, I suction it right back. And then we're going to use, and you can see we've got uh, two canals there. I'm assuming they don't join. That's pretty much my assumption the whole way through. So now we're using Qmix. Uh, this office has a whole bottle of Qmix, so we're just using it. Uh, normally I'll just use EDTA. There's a recent article I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a randomized clinical trial of like 10,000 patients, but it shows there's no difference between EDTA, Qmix. I think it just matters if you clean it out with hypochlorite. 
in my experience. In my experience, endo is just literally bleach and files. That's about it. Keep it simple. So we're doing, we're irrigating significantly. And I use actually, this needle will go all the way down to near my working length because I'm not worried about having sodium hypochlorite incident with uh, my QMix or my EDTA. So we're going to run our sonic activation. And normally I would end my disinfection with this, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually suctioning out my QMix and it's been pretty short. Like if you look on the timer, it's only been 15 minutes. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of hypochlorite back in the canals and use, I'm going to try my gutta percha. Actually, I thought about it right here. I'm like, you know what? It's a little bit, sh actually, there's like another tip here. So what happened here was I placed my gutta percha. I'm going to get back to what I was going to say. I placed my gutta percha. I checked the working length and it's actually a millimeter short. So what can happen to my buddy, Matt, when I was teaching on an endo course with him, you know, he was talking about when you do your irrigating protocol, what can happen is that material from between the isthmus, uh, not that one, like here, material can, debris can fall apically and then get all plugged up. So one thing is to check with your patency file and then re-irrigate. Another way is just to take your last shaping file. That is the wrong one. Take your last shaping file and run it to length by hand just to kind of, you know, build, break up all that, break up all that uh, material. So, and then I was thinking, well, I haven't really, you know, it's been pretty quick. It's been now 16 minutes. Let's put some hypochlorite in there and then we'll do some manual dynamic activation with my gutta percha point and then have my gutta percha point have a, a full strength sodium hypochlorite in there for a little bit longer. Even though it's necrotic, I want to make sure we're going to have great success. So you can see I took a little bit of, uh, placed a little bit of sodium hypochlorite in there. I'm going to take my, my file to length. Whoops, that's not, I wanted to move this out of the way. So you can see I'm going right to length. I'm going to hand file just a little bit, just twisting it around, uh, making sure I'm at full working length because we know that metal is a little more resistant to bending than gutta percha. So I'm going to do it in both file, both canals. Just make sure you can run it also. I'm just placing it by hand. And then I'm going to check to see, and I'm leaving the same gutta percha point because that gives me a reference. I'm like, you know, is, have I now gotten back down a length? And I think I have. So what I'm going to do here is you're going to watch this really simple process. If you don't have an activator, you can use Orsonic, you can just use dynamic manual irrigation. And I tested this in an extracted tooth. I didn't think it worked, but it actually does. We're just moving the gutta percha point up and down about 40 times. And once we irrigate out with sodium hypochlorite, you'll see all the debris come flying out after we do this manual activation again. So you see I'm just pumping the point. You gotta make sure that you, you maintain your working length because there's always a possibility of sending drips of hypochlorite into the apical tissues. So if we maintain our constriction, we're approximately, you know, three quarters of a millimeter away from it. So I'm hopeful we're not getting any irrigant out, but watch this video very closely. When we start irrigating, you'll start to see it be translucent. You'll see all this debris come flying out of there. Look at that. So I like seeing that because it shows me that, okay, even I spent a little more time, we've sonically activated, now we've manually activated. I mean, short of using Gentle Wave, which I'm not about to go purchase because I can't afford it. Um, you know, we're trying to get as much debris out of these canals as possible. So we're gonna dry, we fit our points. One other, what we're doing, another way of validating, making sure I'm at my correct working length. I'm gonna take my gutter percha point. I'm gonna, when it gets wet, if it touches a PDL, it's gonna be, it's gonna to touch, be a little bit wet so I can, the paper becomes bendable. And then I take it and measure it. So that's my last verification. I'm at the right, you know, in the ballpark. Take it there, touch it, the tip bends, measure it, we're done. So everything's pretty much going according to plan. I'm just checking my patency, reconfirming. Probably should have done that a lot earlier, but I'm happy with what's happening here. And then we're going to place our BC sealer. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things you need to watch out right here. So this is a funny little trick. When I saw this, I'm going to insert it and I, it comes up through the other canal. Now don't fool yourself because you're like, oh, we've got a single canal, but actually what happened 
where am I going here? Actually, what happened was likely that sealer is coming up through this isthmus or this isthmus coming back up. So it's psyching you out. And that actually is the same thing for withdrawing, aspirating your irrigant. I found that I've aspirated my irrigant out of here. I'm like, oh, it drained out of this one. But, and they all joined, they joined, but it actually didn't. Actually, that case had two separate canals. So don't be, you know, don't be too, don't be too excited by that, this tech, this thing here. Just tells you that they connect. It doesn't tell you that they actually have the same apex. So what I'm going to do here is I've actually, I'm going to take a 10 file. What I do using a 10 file here, just potentially there's an air bubble underneath that sealer. So I'm just going to take it to working length. And I found that that actually helps seat my cone a little bit better. It's more of a practical thing than just theoretical. I'll coat my cones with some gutter perch, uh, with some sealer. And I forgot to there, you'll see me. So I coat my cones as well, place it down. I'm going to pump it a few times. Make sure I'm at working length. I'm going to do the same thing for the buckle. All right. So with this x-ray, so this is, let me see if I got that. So with this um, microscope, I can actually zoom out. Like I, It's a pretty powerful microscope here. So this is how I take my radiographs. I actually placed the, uh, well, actually Dana did in this case. So let's zoom in here. Okay, so I've worked with all different types of sensors and things and that. So these sensors are okay. I don't really like them, but you have to get the patient to hold. So you take the bite block out, you get the patient to hold the uh, sensor. What I do do routinely all the time is I take the saliva ejector and make sure that the patient has you know, dried out their uh, oral cavity so we don't get saliva drooling everywhere. I don't like these, but this is what they have. This is the only place I use these little paddles. I thought they were a great idea, but they're not because they're they can the patient can move them. And this is the image. So you see, I'm not pointing out what Dana. I mean, I, anyways. So we put the uh, usually what you want to do is come a little more angled. So we're coming straight in, and then this is the radiograph that we got right here. So we clipped a tip, and definitely we all know that you need to see the apex. So what you need to do is come at more of an angle higher up and distal so you can see now it's coming a little it's not much just a little bit higher and then that's going to give you this and that gives you the information you're looking for so i'm in the ballpark i know my apex locator i'm, conf I'm confident with my apex locator i'm like okay maybe there's two canals and you could actually probably a better shot would be take a, a distal shift shot to split it just like this, I don't know, just like this x-ray. They give you even a better idea. This is our final. So that's um, so that's the x-ray there. We take a look. We'll take the paddle out. So then we'll put our frame back in. So what I do actually to, to make sure, because what happens is, you know, after the rubber, trying to put the rubber dam back together, it's just like, look at this mess. So what I'll do is I'll actually, I'll see if I, I don't think I can see it here. I actually tear one the right side of the rubber dam with my rubber dam frame so i'll take one of these little things so right before i take the rubber dam off i tear the corner of that rubber dam so that tells me it's along the patient's right side and then i know every time when i go put the rubber dam frame back on because i'm not good enough to take x-rays with it on <laughs> well uh, i know it's on the right side all right so now what we're going to do is we're doing the it's essentially single cone technique with BC sealer. A fancier way of saying it is hydraulic condensation. Uh, but I love this technique. I've been using it for six years. I, it's solid. And I had a great interview with, uh, I mean, he say about, uh, you know, his ID. He just found it and wanted to start using it. So this is my touch and heat. And we're just literally searing off at the orifice. I use a really, a fairly large, um, heat tip. The little skinny ones are really hard to cut and they don't carry enough heat I find. And then I'll just take a plugger. It doesn't really matter what it is. I've been for 20 years I've been using these Buchanan pluggers. I don't think it, I know you don't need them but use whatever. I'm just kind of burnishing the orifices and that's it. That's what I love about the BC sealer technique. That's what I kind of want to call it is because I can place my cones, take my x-ray. I don't have to mess around with cones anymore. That's it. You know, my, my obturation takes 
I don't know, two minutes. So the next technique, what I do is I take the air water syringe and I just hit air and water and that's, it sprays everything out. I'll put my finger, you're gonna see my finger come over just to kind of keep it from spraying all over the place. So, and I'm, I'm angling this tip to kind of get all the nooks and crannies in that tooth to make sure it's super dry. And then this is a really fancy um, chair that he has. And then what we'll do is we'll air dry it. And there you go. So you can see this is the, the outcome. So, um, you know, we're gonna restore this tooth. I think had I restored it properly, I would have placed a post in this case. You know, put your comments below if, because we've broken, we've got this, this distal wall is gone, this mesial wall is gonna be gone. Um, we're gonna be placing a crown likely. So what I did rather than, cause um, what I elected to do was remove a bunch of gutta percha and then just use composite, pack it down. But let me know, you know, what type of posts you like to use. If you like to use posts, um, that next video, like I said, is going to be the post technique. All right, so let's get started here. We're going to remove the rubber dam. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the rubber dam, move it one tooth back, I think, or maybe not. Oh, no, we're using a garrison. Okay, so this is what I love about microscopes, is you can see, like, right super like amazing light so i'm just removing i'm breaking that mesial wall because there is a crack there that is you know it's just letting bacteria flow right into that tooth so there's no point in keeping it we'll seal it off i'm not chasing a crack that's not what i'm saying it's just fractured and it's got decay so we're going to clean that off dry it. I'm going to remove some more gutta percha. I'm going to keep going down. And I was like, you know what, we should, I can use some of the, the top of the canal as retention. So I'm going to place a little bit of vitrobond right on top of that. I don't think it's necessary. Just as a seal because we're going to be placing a bonding agent. So this is me placing vitrobond <laughs> without a light. It's just, we had to turn the light off so it wouldn't cure. Uh, and then we found the actual filter for the uh, for the microscope. Okay. All right, so we're placing our garrison matrix on the mesial. And yeah, uh, I placed it on the wrong tooth. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, actually. I'm like, oh my gosh. Then restore it. There's nothing to restore on that tooth. So I took it out, placed it in the next one. Place our wedge. Let's take a look, there we go. So this is the older version of the Garrison, but it works just fine. I don't think I've used this for a number of years. There, so yeah, this side was hooked underneath the wedge. It flicked over. So what I'm doing here is I'm just burnishing uh, my margin. There's so many different brands of things to use. You know, keep it simple. Don't use the fancy ones. I found actually the really flimsy, the colored ones from Garrison are way too flimsy. They don't stick at all. These are honestly of all the people I've talked, many people I've talked about using. These are the ones that people prefer. These uh, ones that are kidney bean shaped. They're pretty. They're almost Toffelmeyer stiff. Uh, All right, so we're going to etch. I'm going to place our bonding agent. I'm going to blow it out. I'm going to scrub it into that dentin. Blow it out. Like here. Place my composite. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. A little bit of flowable. This is called a snowplow technique. I don't know. Use whatever tech. I mean, it, it may work, it may not. Who knows? I think you know what really matters is how well the patient takes care of their oral health. Because you can see, I mean, you'll see restoration like, wow, I can't believe that that hasn't decayed and they've just kept it really clean. And you've got others that have perfect, beautiful restorations and they're decayed. So we're just building it up. Uh, pretty standard technique. I prefer just using a little micro brush. And 
and we're gonna cure it. We'll take our stuff off. We'll cure it from the buckle. I'm gonna adjust it. You know, it's a pretty straightforward composite restoration. So one of the things that I didn't have that I like to use is, uh, this is a, some sort of gold knife that she handed me because I wasn't very happy with this right there. Um, usually I'll use a number 12 blade and that's amazing just to get that flash. Uh, so this is a funky kind of gold knife that kind of works. Uh, I was using my 25 blade that I used to cut my gutter percha with. And he's got a really nice contact, I'm happy with it. Now the thing is I probably, in retrospect, and that's what I was thinking about before I posted this, just to talk about placing a post, and we'll talk about that next time, uh, because we got that post creation video. And that's about it. So there's that tooth. We finished and polished it. So now you can see kind of, we'll just go over the radiograph one last time. This is kind of, you know, you see that composite post kind of thing that was created. And then we got our fancy <laughs> two to one, to two to one, to two. And then we've got a little bit of a sealer puff and we'll look at the straight on and there's that. So I called the patient next day. He's feeling great. He's feeling fine. Um, I have had failures, so don't think that I'm not, not human, uh, but it's important. I find important to call the patient next day, see how they're doing. Anyways, if you like what we're doing, keep, in, you know, keep coming back to the channel. It comes here, you know, we're, we're back and forth depending on what's going on. We've got a nice um, couple more, another perio. I'm going to get some suturing stuff online. And thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you soon.